in the first scripture lesson you heard this morning, the Apostle Paul addresses a conflict that was dividing the church. And in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul addresses a particular conflict over food two times, first in chapter 8 and then again in chapter 10. And the second lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through chapter 11, verse 1. And you can find this on page 172 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. Listen as I read the word of the Lord. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth and its fullness are the Lord's. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I mean the other person's conscience, not your own. For why should my liberty be subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why should I be denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, I do not seek my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Loving God, you have so made us that we cannot live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Give us a hunger for your word, and in that food satisfy our daily need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almost 30 years ago now, my parents returned from a once-in-a-lifetime reunion with my father's family in North Korea, Nearly 40 years had passed since my father had been separated by the Korean War from his mother and father, sister and brother. Unfortunately, during those years, his parents had passed away. And so in 1991, my father could visit only their graves. I was not there. But the photographs taken at the grave site show moments of honoring the spirits of my ancestors. A small stone table had been set, food had been prepared and brought, a small mat had been laid, and my parents were kneeling upon it. All of this took place before the grass-covered mounds of earth under which my grandparents were buried. Sounds very foreign, doesn't it? To me too. I had never seen my parents engaged in these practices before. Perhaps had I been younger, they would have waited before showing me those photographs. Even as a 19-year-old, when I asked my mom to describe this event to me, I detected a sense of her parental concern not to confuse me. In the midst of her explanation, she said, you know, of course, this isn't a Christian practice. More than anyone, parents care about how their children receive the knowledge passed on to them. They know their children so well, and they try to give them what they need when they need it. Like Paul, who knew it wouldn't be appropriate to give infants <coughs> solid food, parents are sensitive to the particularities of their children, their unique personalities, their idiosyncrasies, their past experiences, 
and their present needs. It is this attentiveness that makes it possible for parents to meet their children where they are and then to help them flourish from there. Not all of us are parents. We have all, however, been students. From experience, we know that the best teachers are those who find out what their students already know so that when they teach their students something new, they can teach them in a way that helps them to understand that new idea, that new concept, that new way of doing something. There is an art to teaching. There is an art to parenting. There is an art to evangelizing. The ancients called it accommodation or condescension. Accommodation and condescension are terms that may make us raise our eyebrows. Nobody appreciates being condescended to. And accommodation, we know, is a very slippery slope. For now, I ask you temporarily to put aside your skepticism so that we might gain some insight into what the earliest Christians thought about accommodation. For the early church, accommodation was grounded in an understanding of God's relationship with humanity. Accommodation was God's plan to save humanity. They knew, as we do, that on our own, we are incapable of bridging the gap between God on high and our fallen selves. God alone can bridge this gap, lifting us from our sinful state. God does this by coming down, condescending to humanity for the sake of our salvation. This is how we understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Jesus Christ is good news because through his incarnation, life, death, and resurrection, God came down to us so that we could be raised up with him. For Paul, this was God's plan of salvation for humanity. This was the divine economy by which God operates God's household, the whole world. As an evangelist, Paul was concerned about the salvation of each person. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul addressed a conflict over food because in this conflict, he saw a threat to God's plan of salvation. The conflict had been framed by two opposing sides. On one side were those strong Christians who knew that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. These were the Christian doctrines that some in the Corinthian congregation had probably learned from Paul himself. On the other side were those weak Christians who still did not seem to know these things. They continued to inquire about the food they ate. How was the meat prepared? Am I about to eat food that, sh that I shouldn't eat? Behind the conflict over food was a deeper conflict between people with different <coughs> knowledge. The weak thought it necessary to abstain from eating meat sacrificed to idols, while the strong thought that since idols were nothing, what they ate would make no difference. As you can imagine, if the weak observed the strong eating meats that had been sacrificed to idols, influenced by their example, the weak might have eaten against their own conscience. From Paul's rhetoric, we can assume that there was a common saying in his day, and it went something like, act for the sake of conscience. It's a saying and a moral principle that has endured into our own day. The right to act according to your own conscience has come to be recognized by many, though not all, groups and governments as an inalienable right. In the West, 
religious documents such as the Declaration on Religious Freedom by the Second Vatican Council, and secular documents drawn up by the United Nations declare that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, and religion. Presbyterians, too, protect this right. As Presbyterians, we vote on church matters according to our consciences. And this is precisely what our Book of Order tells us to do. Even if we think that our neighbor lacks the necessary facts and furthermore doesn't think about the facts in the right way, we nevertheless uphold his or her right to vote according to what he or she thinks is true, according to his or her conscience. And we expect that we will receive that same respect. But in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul says something remarkable. He says, act for the sake of conscience. I mean the other's conscience, not your own. Paul, like a true leader, refrains the conflict over food in Corinth. He knows that the Corinthians have been approaching this conflict in terms of their freedom. In Paul's day, the issue of freedom, the freedom to do whatever one wants, was the primary framework for approaching almost any social and political issue in that time. No matter the specific issue at hand, debates within the church and in the Greco-Roman world at large were often framed by people on different sides who argued against compromising against conciliating the other side, because to do so would entail some loss of their own freedom. The conflict over food in Corinth was no exception. People on both sides were asserting their freedom to act according to their consciences, that is, according to what they knew to be right or true. The unavoidable result was schism. By exhorting the Corinthians to act for the sake of conscience, not their own, but the other's conscience, Paul reframes the debate in terms of accommodation. He wants the Corinthians to learn the art of accommodating. What would it mean for us to act for the sake of another's conscience? For the strong Corinthians, it would mean that they would not eat meat. I think, however, that Paul had a greater moral challenge in mind than the challenge to abstain from eating meat. Acting for the sake of someone else's conscience required that the strong, the people who thought they had all the answers, give up some of their liberties for the sake of the weak. Paul could not tolerate seeing the strong claiming the liberty in the very act that enslaved the weak to idolatry. So he warns them, take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. By your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. Paul reminds the Corinthians that Christ died for the weak. Christ became human and suffered the worst ills of humanity, all for the sake of our salvation. And it is Christ's example of accommodation that Paul imitates, and Paul's example that we are exhorted to imitate. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ, Paul says. The idea of accommodation may surprise you as a basis for a social ethic. It becomes, however, all the more significant 
in a religiously diverse world. The conflict over food gives us a glimpse into the complex and diverse religious world of the early church. Remember, Paul was a city person. Unlike Jesus, whose language reflects his familiarity with Palestinian village life, Paul drew on metaphors of schoolroom, workshop, stadium, gymnasium, more than images of rural life. As a missionary, Paul made his rounds to strategically located cities of the Northeast Mediterranean Basin. And that's why some scholars have attributed to Paul the first urban movement of Christianity. In the cities of the Mediterranean world, Greek pagan religions, Judaism, and Christianity existed side by side, influencing each other to such an extent that it was no simple task to determine where the boundaries lay. In his letter to the city churches, Paul addresses a number of disputes that arise on these boundaries. And if we read carefully, we can observe that he does so with what New Testament scholar Margaret Mitchell calls a rhetoric of reconciliation. In our day, people everywhere, like the early urban Christians, increasingly interact with people who have knowledge that is different from our own. In her book, A New Religious America, Harvard professor Diana Eck describes the religious diversity that has come to characterize America's landscape, not just its urban, but also its rural landscape. She writes, the huge white domes of a mosque with its minarets rises from the cornfields just outside Toledo, Ohio. You can see it as you drive by on the interstate highway. A great Hindu temple with elephants carved in relief at the doorway stands on a hillside in the western suburbs of Nashville, Tennessee. A Cambodian Buddhist temple and monastery with a hint of Southeast Asian roofline is set in the farmlands south of Minneapolis, Minnesota. In suburban Fremont, California, flags fly from the golden domes of a Sikh Gurdwara on Hillside Terrace, now renamed Gurdwara Road. They are the architectural signs of a new religious America. For some of you, the contours of a new religious America are found right in your own families. As you know, I grew up in a Korean family with many Presbyterian pastors, including some of the earliest Korean Presbyterian pastors. Who knew that I would marry a Roman Catholic with four sisters married to an Iraqi, an Italian-American Catholic, a Jewish-American, and a Turkish Muslim? I distinctly remember my dad saying to me at my wedding rehearsal dinner that the United Nations should give my husband's family an award. <laughs> he was joking, but he was also serious because he knew, as many of us know, how challenging it can be for religious commitments to help rather than to hinder relationships in a pluralistic world. Years ago, I came across a lively debate on the Presbyterian Church website called the Jesus Debate. It centered around the very important issue of being Christian in the midst of pluralism. The debate started with a report about the Presbyterian peacemaking conference held not long before. One of the speakers at the conference, the Reverend Dirk Ficke, raised the question, how can a Christian be committed to her own faith while fully being engaged in a religiously diverse world. Given the diversity in our communities, in our families, and even in our individual life histories, this is a significant question. The Reverend Ficke outlined a variety of possible responses. Some Christians think that they alone know the truth and that therefore there's no reason to pursue truth in dialogue with others. <clears throat> 
These are the exclusivists. Others take an inclusivist stance. That is, that we can include other religious traditions because they have the partial picture of the truth while we have the whole picture. Relativists say, actually, there is no such thing as truth with a capital T, so every opinion is relative to another opinion, and no opinion is absolute. There are also some who say that we should pay attention not to the particularities of each religion, because in this way, religions differ too much. Rather, we should look for the most universal principles that all religions share. We can call this a reductionist approach to religious pluralism. There are a number of other options that we could list and think about. If you are like me, you might find something of value in each position, but something problematic as well. As a Christian, I don't want to water down my faith in Christ. I cannot give Christ up just because that's the main thing standing between me and a non-Christian. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul provides us with another alternative, one that is grounded in God's plan for salvation, grounded in the cross. For Paul, the incarnation, crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was the ultimate event of divine accommodation. As a pastor and missionary, Paul modeled himself after Christ and called others to do the same. Like the parent concerned about how her child receives the knowledge passed down like the teacher who adapts his style to the needs of his student, or like Paul, who became all things to all people, we can be in relationships of genuine love and concern for the other person's well-being. And yet accommodating relationships don't have to be marked by unchanging hierarchies of authority. We can strive for relationships of mutuality and reciprocity in which everyone recognizes that it's not always enough to act according to what one knows. While knowledge puffs up, love builds up. What would this look like? Perhaps it would take the form of sharing stories by which we would express how we came to believe what we believe in, and came to be committed to what we are committed to, and came to do what we do. Perhaps it would take a willingness, if so compelled by what we hear, to be transformed by the other person's concerns, values, and ways of seeing the world. We don't need to fear that in our willingness to be transformed, we are risking the core of our Christian beliefs. The willingness to be transformed is rooted in the cross. Out of love for us, Christ willingly transformed himself by becoming like us, taking on our suffering and dying a human death, all for our sake. Imitating Christ in requires more than simply acting according to what we know. It requires more than acting for the sake of our own consciences. Our pursuits of truth can not only be for our benefit, they must be for the benefit of everyone. And that's the good news of Christ. That is God's divine economy. Amen.